Hello everyone, my name is Joe Scorsone, the channel is called EthanetWink, and in today's video what we're going to be doing is day 12 of the Quant Finance Advent of Code. What we're going to be doing today is our first kind of advanced strategy. It's going to, do a, it's going to be a trend following strategy with the first exponent. So we're going to get into that, and yeah, we're going to hop straight into it. Um, thank you guys for um, all the support with the X account. Make sure you follow this so you can see all the updates at first and no one on spaces with a bunch of awesome traders. Um, if you guys actively trade, then my algo I made with Lux Algo might be the um, tool for you. So if you visit the link in the description, you can learn more about it. And yeah, so let's hop right into this code then. We're not going to waste no time. So we're going to start with last video's code, change the signals to be from the Hearst exponent, calculate the Hearst exponent from scratch, and plot the account balance with the Hearst exponent. Cool. So I got everything the same here. Um, I did change the plotting. We'll get into that. But, um, and I did change the back tester. I said in the last video I wanted to make it into a class, so we're going to do that. In our initialize function, I just want the configs, the cache, and the start and end. So I have everything else in here. Uh, nothing else is outside these two classes. So I got the to get stock data. We're going to go over how you calculate the Hearst exponent. Add in the strategy. It's going to be the same kind of logic with these signals. Simulate back test is identical. Plot balance, I just changed it to have subplots. So we have two rows and then balance and Hearst and uh, different titles. Make sure you still have the plot title so you know what backtest you're looking at. Run backtest is here, and then we need to just run all backtests so that way we can um, solve out run backtest. That way it'll call this function which each with each uh, window that we want, which each risk, take profit, stop loss, all of that uh, good stuff. So, and then we need to await uh, and gather every task. So now in our main here, I really just have BTs that are back tester and await run every back test. So that's pretty much it. I think it's a lot simpler in the main. Looks a lot prettier, a lot easier on the eyes. Regardless though, we're gonna go over uh, the Hearst exponent now. So if you don't know what that is at all, the Hearst exponent is gonna be a value between zero and one. And a value above 0 0.5 means that the time series or whatever you're looking at is trending. And if it's below 0 0.5, it means that it is mean reverting. So it is a trend following strategy. Or a, look, okay, it's just, it's a strategy. It's information, right? And then we can make a strategy about it. This particular strategy is going to be if it breaks above or below 0 0.5 without being above or below 0 0.5 before. So yeah, let's go over this. So if you want to set a max window, you can. If not, uh, I'm just doing floor division of how big our window is and two. So that way we don't have to worry about dividing by um, a float. It'll always be an integer. So now we need to make sure that we have two points in our time series because that is enough to make a line. So now the Hearst exponent is a rescaled range analysis. What does that mean? Well, we're going to get into that. But the whole point of the Hearst exponent is that the stock market is what's called fractal. Stock market being fractal means that if I show you a daily time frame and a secondly time frame, they're going to look the same. Right, the candlesticks, the wicks, all that stuff, they all look the same. You could tell the difference between a one minute chart and a five minute chart. That is the coolest party trick I've ever seen. A one minute chart and a daily even, right? They all look the same. And so this takes advantage of that, that the patterns will repeat and we can explain the um, differences in the stock market by changing the size of the series that we're looking at, zooming in and out with how big our time series is because it's all gonna look the same. So that's why we have to have multiple um, multiple values in this. So we're going to get a, an array of 2 to our max window size. So if this is 10, it's going to go from 2 to 101. So now for every i in 10, so again, we're going to start at 2, go to the max, we're going to get a subseries. So um, I think that the, that documentation just explains this the best. So that's all we're, what we're going to look at. If we want an MP dot, um, if we want an array of just 8, so x is just an array with 8 in it, and then we split that array to be with our, we split that array with three. Then we're gonna get an array of arrays. We're gonna get an array of zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven. That all adds up to eight. That doesn't add up to eight, but it represents eight, right? Because we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? We have eight. And this is going up to eight pretty much. So now, we have to split it into a subarray of equal size. That's why it's important too, in case um, we don't want to do, we don't want to deal with if it's not uh, equally equally divisible. 
if we have too um, too long of something. So that's why we're doing it like this, and that's why we're using floor division again, right here. I think that the document that this documentation just explains it the best. So if we have nine, and we want to split it up with four, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, and it handles the size of each one for us, which is very convenient. So now R values and S values, it's just going to be empty lists. So now for every series in the subseries, because remember it returns multiple arrays in an array, we can do stuff. So it has to be bigger than two, so that way we can make a line. And then we could actually calculate, um, start to calculate what we need for the Hearst exponent. It, the arithmetic is really simple. It's just the fact that you have to do this that kind of makes it a lot harder. <laughs> that does make it harder. It makes it a little bit more difficult to understand because um, when you're at three, how do I, how do I want to say this? When you're at three, you're going to have um, less subarrays, right? And then when you actually get up to the top, you're going to have more subarrays, right? So you're going to split it up. We're going to get you're going to get finer in every individual calculation. That's how I wanted to say that. That was good. That's a good explanation. <laughs> so we got our mean. Get the cumulative sum of the series minus the mean. Get the range of the z. Get the standard deviation of the series. A little error handling. Make sure you don't divide by zero. And then just depend the values if we can. If not, we're going to continue looping. We're going to get the average r over s appended to our to our rs. If the length of our rs is less than two, we're going to return nothing because we can't make a line with that. If not, we're going to get the log of n up to rs. Again, make sure that they're the same lengths, and then we're going to get the log of rs. And then the slope is going to be we're just going to polyfit that with the degree of one get our slope back. If we have an error in doing that math, we're going to return um, not a number. Or we're going to return NAN. So once you get past this aspect of it, um, I think it's easy to understand. I think it's a little chewy at first. This is the hardest part of it, I think. It's just this step. Because you're starting with um, splitting it up. You're starting with splitting your data up into less categories. So your ranges, everything is just going to be um, affected by more numbers. Instead of when you get to the end, every subarray will be a lot finer, be a lot smaller. So yeah, then that's our strategy. So then um, if it's above 0 0.5, that's a long signal. If it's below it, it's a short signal. Remember, crosses. So that way we don't just get in, we don't want to always be in a position. So now if we open up a terminal and we run our strategy, uh, we can just wait. That's just a message. And then we can just keep on waiting. And then there we go. We're going to get um, all of our bad tests. It does take a while to process this. Even though it's doing it asynchronously, this is just still um, a lot of stuff. <laughs> so yeah, as this finishes, um, I hope that you guys are enjoying this series. It's really annoying that it makes just flashbangs me. But um, I hope that you guys are enjoying this series. I hope that... Um, you guys are going to enjoy the strategies that we're going to make together. Um, this video is all about trending strategies, and then the next video is going to be all about mean reverting strategies. Um, and then we're going to get into more of the stress testing our portfolio kind of thing. So that way, if we had a portfolio of like some long-term holds, a little bit of active trading, and stuff like that, how could we actually get portfolio metrics? And then a video after that will be uh, stress testing it. So that's what the uh, roadmap will be ahead. Um, <laughs> it's so annoying that it just keeps on flashbanging me. But um, yeah, I hope that you guys are enjoying this series. Um, thank you guys for bearing with me for when I do these videos, like just kind of talking over what it's already written. It's a lot easier mentally for me to do that, especially for something like this. I would have to go through a lot if I was typing this and explaining this at the same time. And um, my semester is almost over. I have two more finals. I have to go study for one <laughs> right after this. But yeah, um, thanks for bearing with me with that. It's still a fun series. I'm still glad I'm doing it. I'm not complaining at all. But yeah, it seems like the strategy on Microsoft is was doing the best. Um, pretty much it did double at one point, did it? Oh, it got so close, 98%. But um. 
That's not how math goes. Almost 10%. <laughs> um, yeah, though. And so you'd look at this, some people would look at this and be like, oh, only a 10% return. Well, we're only putting 10% of the account on every trade. So if you actually were to invest with this like full port, like when you see like a stock's return, you know, I mean, Microsoft returned a lot more than 10%, but if you only put 10% of your portfolio on it, only 10% of your portfolio would get that return. If you were to put your entire portfolio on this, then yeah, it would have doubled, you know what I mean? So that's, um, I just wanted to explain that in case, um, in case there was an oversight, but um, yeah, that's all for this video. Next video will be about a mean inversion strategy. Um, that's pretty much it. I hope that you guys are enjoying the series. Drop any feedback you guys got from me, and yeah, I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.